not really. I, st I started my video. That's uh, okay. Not in that specific order or anything. So should I introduce you? Uh, no, well, maybe you should introduce yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I should introduce you. No, why? You're because you're two May. Yeah, but you're I'm a scholarship good. winner. Yes, scholarship. Summer scholarship winner. Summer scholarship winner. And it's been a fun month. Yeah, you've been here for that. Whole month. Yep. How was it? Okay. I think the first two weeks, the first week was like, I felt like really long, I guess, because I was like getting all the stuff for the first time and just started working. Took long enough starting that first bar. And should probably start with the cat throwing us soon as the second week. Yeah. But, yeah. But I think I wasn't ready. But since when I just set it up, I thought, like, there is no way I can do this right now. I remember. So it just stood there, but the, up, the upper, lower, and top line was. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. And you figured it out pretty quick. Mm -hmm. So it's still kind of misty. Yeah. Anyway, if you can introduce yourself, like I'm Ryan Brown, teacher, I'm director. Yeah. You've been teaching for Painter. teaching for I don't know. Uh, I taught a little bit from two thousand three oh, to two thousand six, wow. and then went back to school. Graduated from Lawrence Academy in two thousand eight, and then uh, came back and started teaching again. That's when we opened the school. And so we've been going for the Center of Academic Study. Yeah, we called it the Center for Academic Study. Initially, that wasn't a very good title, so we changed it to the Master's Academy of Art. Makes more sense. So, yeah, we've been doing it for ten years. Okay, let's see. Now that we touched the name part, like. Why did you choose to name it like the Academy of Masters Academy of Art and not the uh, Ryan Brown Atelier or something like that? Um, because the, w the way I understand it is there's a difference between an academy and, a, and an atelier. In, in the 19th century, they had both. They had the Beaux-Arts Academy, which taught more of the rigorous sort of regulated progressional type of education and then students would also study at an atelier an atelier being more of a master studio where um, you would pick a particular master whose technique or methods you liked and um, wanted to emulate and you would study uh, more of their preferred specific uh, yeah um, methods uh, you know Carlos de Ron or Messier, Jerome, Bouguereau, um, you know, depending on, on whose uh, particular bend you liked more, you would choose a, a particular atelier. So you had the academy and the atelier system combined to, um, which I, I think was a pretty brilliant educational system. Um, but for me, I wanted to create a school that was geared more towards that regulated progression. I wanted an academy and, uh, because I don't know that I have a particular style. I don't know what my paintings look like to other people. And um, it just seemed really out of place and arrogant for me to, to say, you know, yeah, come step Ryan in my, my way, yeah, the Ryan Brown Atelier just didn't, you know, that's not what it's about for me. It's about just trying to help students learn really good 
principles that will make them their best selves, you know, not just younger, better versions of me. And well, we already touched like yeah, two topics on why why teaching, why do you what what was your interest or why like keep teaching and, and not going just focus on your personal project? Um, that's pretty easy because when I went to the Florence Academy at first, it, it seemed like nobody, it was still pretty young, n nobody had heard of it or knew what academic training was. And uh, so when I experienced it, I was shocked at how accessible the information was, how readily available the that sort of or the ease of progress was through this educational system and i thought man i spent four and a half years at the university just fumbling around um in an ineffective system trying to figure out things on your side on your yeah own. and ultimately blaming myself for not progressing the way i thought maybe i could and, and really it was just, uh, you know, trying to function under a broken system and then experiencing a really good education. The natural thing was to come home and say to everybody, there's something better. There's, this is unbelievable. This is amazing. You could do so well it, uh, uh, under this sort of umbrella of progressional studies. Um, and so sharing it was just normal. It was, it seemed like, like, I can't, I couldn't have that experience and not just come shout it from the rooftops to everybody that would listen, you know, it's just, it was too, it was too amazing. Um, so that's, that was the motivation for me is I just, I couldn't believe how brilliant the educational system was. Um, that, that's it, I guess. Why Florence and not like, uh... I don't know, Paris or Barcelona? Paris didn't have a school. Uh, Barcelona didn't have a school. London didn't have a school. I mean, the two, the two main schools were, were in Florence and New York at the time. And yeah, uh, yeah, at the, at the time, early on, it was Water Street. Water Street, uh, that's near. Yeah, and then Gr Grand Central started a few years later. Um, that was definitely an option, but... Um, I really, I'd been to Europe a few times and I, I kind of liked the idea of living in Europe and, uh, and it was actually a lot cheaper to go to Florence and live in Florence than it was to live in New York. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, I guess part of it was money and part of it was just Europe itself. I wanted to live in Europe. Your three favorite artists, past and present, past like old masters and three contemporary, three of each. Can I give you? Can I give you three hundred? Yeah, I <laughs> suppose we could. I don't know. That's tough. Let's say five then. Um, Waterhouse is always up there for me. He's. Uh, He's one I always come back to. I think Sargent, Sargent is frustratingly good in a way that feels totally untouchable to me. Uh, uh, he's like, he's like the Michael Jordan of painting, you know? Like, like everybody works hard, but there's something special about Michael Jordan. Do you know what I'm saying? There's something like beyond the normal realm of good, and Sargent seemed to be that. So, so I always do come back to Sargent, but there's something about what he did that I just don't under, understand, and so I can't, I can't relate to that level of genius. Um, where there's there's other artists that I feel like what they did obviously was brilliant, but I feel like maybe maybe what they were doing is is something I could. Attain, you know. Sergeant's not one of those for me, um, but I. But he's one of my favorites. Um, I love Peter Monstead and Ivan Shishkin and and 
uh, Edward Harrison Compton and um, Thomas Moran and, and geez, I don't know, Albert Edifelt and Peter Croyer and Ilya Repin, to name a few. Uh, dead ones, living ones. Living ones. My favorite. Hmm. I, I like Paul Raymond Seaton's Still Lifes. Uh, his florals are pretty amazing. Um, I like uh, um, I like some young guys like Nick Alm and, and um, Jamie Korth. I, I think are doing uh, pretty special things. I think Jamie Korth is especially doing some pretty special stuff. Um, I like uh, oh, I like the sense of design in Glenn Dean's work. I like um, I like Clyde Aspervig's landscapes, uh, and uh, T. Allen Lawson has some amazing. Just his compressed color sense is phenomenal. Um, uh, I, I really. I really think like Will St. John, Colleen Berry, Jordan Sokol have turned a huge corner in terms of portraiture that um, is going to help everybody's game rise as soon as they start to understand what, what those guys are doing. Um, I think Jeremy Lipking has a really special, something special about him. Um, I, I like a lot of his work, uh, but, but most of those people, I, I also, not all of them, I haven't met T. Allen Lawson or, or Nick Alm yet, but most of those other people I'm fortunate enough to like have friendships with. And so I'm not just a fan of their work, they're, they're like really good people on top of that, which um, makes it all the better, you know, to know them individually and, and to kind of understand what makes them what motivates them and how they developed and um, you know the personality behind the paintings is is uh, you know an extra special thing. Nice costume, epic costume, values. Why do we do a realism? Why don't why aren't we like more abstract, visual, contemporary art people? Or why don't why wouldn't you go into that onto that side? Or... Um, that was never really an option for me. I just I, I think I, I I can't really say why for sure, but I, I think it's somewhat related to my love of sports and my upbringing in sports. I always I always played sports. And that always came before art. You know, I, I didn't know I was really into art or I had no idea what art was really growing up. Um, I, I had uh, uh, an interest in drawing, but not to the point of being really aware of, of that or, you know, why it was an interest. Whereas sports was just like a constant thing that I did. And in sports, it's, it's a, a complete meritocracy. If you're if you're good, you get pro the proper attention for being good. Yeah, and 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 um, and so I think art is somewhat of an extension of that. Where I feel like um, skill has something to do with it, and I and. Um, that there's a merit to to work. You know, when I go to a museum, part of part of the joy for me is similar to the joy I have when watching the Olympics. It's amazing to see people who have dedicated their lives to something that got so good at that thing. It's a, it's amazing that somebody can do that, you know? And that's for me going to the museums is like that. It's it's, I stand amazed at human achievement level of what I'm viewing. And, um, 
and I've never felt the same in abstract art or any of the conceptual stuff. It, 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 it seems so base and ridiculous and it, it seems like somebody's trying to make me believe something that's not real, that they're trying to like play like play it off as, as an achievement when it's not. And uh, I, I'm not saying that uh, it's not interesting. I think, I think there's a difference between finding something interesting or walking in and saying, oh, that's, I, I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I think that validates uh, a lot of contemporary or, or abstract mm -hmm. art. I, I think the fact that you can find it interesting or unique validates it, but I don't think in my mind that it elevates it. Do you know what I'm saying? A validation is not an elevation to a higher status. And the, but, but when you add real skill development and dedication and purpose, and then the ability to communicate, communicate something clearly to an audience, um, that's a whole nother level of art. And that communication is huge for me because that's the purpose of, visual, of the visual language. If, if you're not, if you have a message and it doesn't come across clearly in any language, then it's ineffective. And art being a visual language, then the point of it has to, has to be, or the clarity with which that point comes through to, through to an audience is part of whether or not it's, it's an effective work. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and that's part of the mastery of the medium. Uh, so, so if that is largely absent in a work, then the mastery level, again, based on my belief in meritocracy, the mastery level drops significantly. Uh, so the, the ability to communicate is pretty important for me. And, and it all comes down to the ability that I, one human being as an artist has to communicate to another human being on that basic human level, right? The, you, sort of devoid of culture, uh, to the side of race or religion. Uh, there's, a, there's a commonality that we all share in, in terms of understanding beauty, in terms of human emotion, in terms of loss and love and connection that we all understand beyond our upbringing. Do you know what I'm saying? Just on a human level. And when you can communicate relative to that human condition, I think there's something very special about that. And I, I don't see any other art doing that as effectively as representational art. It's a long answer for a simple well, question. Yeah. That's the way it is. Uh, going to more technical stuff, maybe. What is this method that you use constantly? It comes from the Florence Academy, but before that. Yeah, I mean, I guess the lineage uh, is I studied with Dan Graves, who studied with Richard Black, who studied with Ives Campbell, who studied with Bill Paxton, who studied with Jerome, I think is the, is the direct lineage. Um, a lot, I'm sure, you know, through each generation changes and alters and shifts. But, you know, I've studied a lot of um, written material on on what they were doing in the 19th century and, and how they would approach teaching, how the uh, systems of education were set up. Because I'm always trying to refine the education we offer here. I'm trying to figure out how do we, how do we streamline it better? How do we more effectively communicate to students? And so, it, you know, from my understanding, it, it, it's kind of the base of it, the foundation of it comes from the way that they would teach in 19th century Paris, which was kind of a catalyst for how they would also have taught in the schools of Spain and the schools uh, in Germany, and, and then Ilya Repin took that back to Russia as well. Okay. So. And some people took it, well, took it to America. And, uh, 
Yeah, yeah. So I think I think it all kind of came from from how they approached education in Paris, and it was just extremely effective. Obviously, I mean, Paris was the epicenter of the art world in the nineteenth century, and it turned out thousands of phenomenal masters that were each unique. Uh, yeah, so we just try to emulate that as best we can. Yeah. Can I ask him, um, why do we practice figure with mirrored models? Um, I think it's always been the, What's the, canon, you know? the standard because um, you're trying to understand the most complex. Uh, I guess the most complex subject that we're presented with, which is the human figure, right? There's and and understanding the human figure is is understanding. I think building a foundation for, especially representation representational art, like I was saying, the the foundation for what we would use as the catalyst to communicate a narrative to viewers, right? We it, when you put a figure in a painting. There's something com that communicates just based on the fact that we understand that as a as another person, and um, so so drawing from the nude, you are kind of stripping that down to understand all of the essentials, the anatomy, the rhythms, uh, uh, the uh, the balance of it, how to define form and space, uh, and to really get at the core knowledge of what, of how to define something in two dimensions or three dimensions as the sculptor um, that best mimics in your chosen medium, mimics life. Um, so understanding that life and having it in front of you for hours a day, weeks on end, years on end mm -hmm. is really important to, um, be able to understand that main catalyst for everything that we would do afterwards. Yeah. Why is drawing so important? Drawing is the base foundational knowledge of it, of every art, I mean, of, of all of the painting and sculpture. And um, I couldn't have said that more clumsily, but. Um, Sometimes I just think about it like that. If we're saying it's a language, sometimes I think like drawing is just the ABC. If you know the ABC, you can yeah. write. If you cannot write, you cannot read. If you can, and so on and on and on and on. You can do all of these yeah. things. I would say it's even more. I'd say it's the it's the ABCs. It's the spelling. It's the sentence structure. It's the grammar. It's the uh, the theory. It's 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 the bulk of language. And then uh, the only thing you add to that later is a, is color and brushwork. I mean, what do you what do you add beyond drawing when you move to painting? What what are the two things that you add? It's color and brushwork. Everything else in a painting is drawing. So you're 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 talking about the the massive amount of language. Ninety percent of it is is drawing. Uh, the rest is relatively easy comparative compared to that and for you where does the line and like uh, where afterward is drawing and where does painting start like there is usual there's usually like people that are going to say that well, like some, that's a nice painting and you're drawing or i think i'm drawing and then somebody paints and they say like is it really good at drawing What's the main difference? For one of my teachers back in the faculty, it's the it's having more than just like a going beyond the monochrome, like not just having sepias or yellows or one color. It's having like analog colors. It's having contrast, and then you have the painting. That's why you can paint with pastels, with yeah. dry pastels. I don't. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. 
the the because a, a drawing can be painterly, uh, but a painting can almost seem more more drawn. You know, I, I think um, ultimately for me, I'd like to. I, I like the fluidity of painting, and so I try in my drawings. I'm I'm always thinking a little bit more painterly uh, about how to establish the forms and and pivotal elements in the drawing in a more painterly manner. Um, but I, I don't know what the I don't know what the line is. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Um, For you, where is that? The difference between one and the other, like just saying this is a drawing and this is a painting. Yeah, probably it's as, as simple as medium. You know, if I do it in pencil or charcoal, I'll call it a drawing. If, if I then there's, for example, I don't know, ink. I think you can paint with ink. Yeah, and you can draw with ink. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't <laughs> know. That's a good question. I hadn't thought of thought of that before. Because you could you could also mix you know charcoal dust. With uh, yeah, dust and brush it. In. Yeah, brush it in. Is it still more? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I don't really care what people call it, if as long as I like it and buy it, call it whatever you want. <laughs> uh, well, not just like really technical stuff, which is like one of the reasons I want to go over. Like we start with graphite then charcoal is there like any sequence to it like where we would i don't know watercolors come in or colored pencils or i don't know i think the the basic thought process for me in terms of education is mm -hmm. to keep it as streamlined as possible so that people can get all the foundational stuff so so once you have the foundations, you can kind of experiment on your own with different mediums if you want. Um, we don't we don't teach watercolor for one reason, just because I don't feel confident enough in the medium no, to very hard. to feel like I can like guide somebody through that. Um, I don't really use colored pencils or acrylic or a, a lot of that other stuff, so I I again don't have the I don't feel like I have knowledge in that to, to pass on so I don't teach it because I don't know it um, but also in terms of simplifying the process of learning for somebody uh, I try to keep it at a again a, a regulated progression we, we add more difficult things onto simpler things right if you can start in pencil graphite it's a much easier medium to control and then we move into charcoal from there uh, uh, and then into charcoal heightened with white from there, and, and then on to Brazai painting and, and limited palette and then full palette. So I, I think each, each step of the progression allows students to uh, gain an understanding and a mastery of this element of it that I can then now uh, expand uh, my efforts into more, more complex things. Uh, so, so that's the reason I kind of follow that progression, but um, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you choose the papers we used? Initially, I, I was using the stuff that uh, I used at Florence Academy, and then over the years, I've kind of expanded that a little bit uh, as I've talked to different artists. Uh, experimented with different materials. We're still we're still figuring it out. Uh, you know, I was just in Paris in May and and met with Shane Wolf, and he showed me a way of preparing paper that like was unbelievable. It's just makes drawing with charcoal so much nicer than stuff that I've used before. So um, I'm always trying to be aware of. Of what other people are doing and the effects that they're getting on that and, and seeing if, if that would be beneficial for our students to do or use um, so yeah the choice has kind of evolved over time the different papers different materials give different effects and so depending on the exercise we can vary those materials
Yeah, I asked because when I go back there, I told them the things I'm going to have to do and like compare what I have yeah. to the materials that I use here and yeah. look for options and cheap options, maybe, for yeah. school and stuff. So, yeah, that's why. How do you choose the pose for the model? And the lighting according to it? Um, I think that's just evolved over time. I think I've just seen so many great drawings. Uh, I think obviously it comes from the antique. It, it begins at the antique. You're looking at history to say um, what are effective poses, what are uh, um, what gives a certain sense of drama or maybe accentuates certain elements of the human figure in, in a way that would benefit the students to study. Uh, and, and so just develop, over time, I've, we've developed a sense of, of um, you know, what poses work best for good drawings, what poses are great to, uh, to study these elements of anatomy or this element of, of gesture and rhythm. Uh, it's dependent on the model themselves. You know, what kind of, uh, some models are a little bit stiffer, so we, we have to adjust the pose uh, to try and get a rhythm that may not be natural to their to their figure. Um, some models are amazingly rhythmic, so we want to take advantage of that. So we'll put them in poses that really accentuate that. Um, so there's there's a lot of factors, but it, it always goes back to what's going to work best for this model, this body type, and and for the students to study something really specific. We're, we're constantly trying to change model body type so that they can practice a bunch of different uh, um, have, a, have a wider range of understanding of different yeah, types of bodies not but, memorizing this stuff and repeating yeah this stuff. so uh, yeah but it's it's relative to what works with the model and relative to trying to fit something that is historically relevant and and then relative to what the students uh, uh what would be good for the students to study in Mexico, we're like we got to use to like uh, there was this model that told us like uh, draftsmen in Mexico are lazy, and we were like what why? And she said like it's because when she went to a photo shoot, the photographer knows exactly what he's looking for, so he would have like a sequence like a sequence of poses he wants to, and the lighting is always is already like in his mind he knows what how he wants to do the shoot, the shot. And we usually let the models like do their own thing. And that's probably because also we are not used to do like uh, any long poses. Yeah. So the first ones, which are like one minute or two minutes, right. and you're gonna have like 10 of those. And now, like a few years later, I've kind of thought that that could work. But that's in order for you to like get to know the model, know what he or she can do, what yeah. poses look better or worse, what's the angle that would probably fit, fit her better. And then we would have to choose a pose. I just went to like one session where they were like taking turns, all the people in there, and everyone had to choose one pose. Like the next pose is yours, you have to yeah. think what you want. And what do you want to do? How do you want to set up? Yeah, here it's a little different. I understand, but like if you have a, I've been in model sessions where you're doing like 30 second, one minute, two minute, five minute poses. I mean, yep. you're not going to spend a minute setting up a pose, or you're not going to spend five minutes setting up a one minute pose. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, giving direction to the model, you're just, um, to me, I, I, I don't find a lot of value in those short poses anyways, um, but it, it, for us, if we're spending four weeks on a pose, we want something that is really, really well designed. We're considering the subtle tilt of the head, we're considering the hand position, we're considering the foot position, we're considering the lighting. So typically, on the first day of a four-week pose, 
our students will spend anywhere from an hour to a full three hours just refining the, the setup of the model so that it's I, as ideal as we can get. Um, that makes sense on a, on a four week pose, right? Yep. Uh, but we have twice a, a week, we have two hour poses. And you know, those we can set up in, in a, minute. A, a minute or two. You know, it's, it will just kind of go to basic standards and a very simple, straightforward poses, simple lighting. Um, uh, the purpose for those exercises being somewhat different. So, but even then, um, uh, you know, we've got more advanced students that are setting those up. So they have developed like an understanding of what, what's a good pose and why. So they can do it a little bit faster, you know, but, but there is always a pretty particular purpose behind the pose. It's not just a, a random do whatever you want. Um, you know, I don't like to leave it up to the models either because they don't know what that oftentimes they don't know what it, it's going to look like from the outside and they don't necessarily know what's going to look good for a drawing. Um, although I have worked with like models who are professional art models and obviously they're a, a little bit more attuned to to it than um, the, the average model we use. The average model we use here is, is you know, more just like students that need a part-time job or something. So um, we, we, we try to guide them as much as we, uh, as much as we can. Yeah, well, we're too used to like let the model do their thing. As far as that goes, I think I've had the best experiences with actresses mm -hmm. because they kind of know what they look like from the outside or from, from different points of view. So that helps. Yeah. But you know, we're, we're still having kind of a hard time like choosing a pose and actually know what to do. I mean, something as simple as the, the role that Julia Barnstead puts in her book, like you have to have a 30% shadow, mm. something like that on the pose, ideally. Yeah with a few highlights and very defined shadow, so yeah, that will come in time, I hope. Yeah, I, I mean, just being attuned to it, uh, just constantly looking at great drawings, constantly looking at like, uh, you know, and, then, and now it's accessible because there's t a lot of academies with a lot of students turning out a lot of good drawings. So, so you can see how effective certain poses are through those drawings. And so if you, I always come into a, uh, you know, if I know who the model is, I can uh, consider it before the session even starts. So I have an idea of what I want before the model even shows up. It makes it a lot easier, a lot faster. Yeah, about the, also about the quick drawings, like the gestures and stuff, like 30 seconds, 10 minutes. Bryce was telling us yesterday that he had a student come in and she was just like making this beautiful like two minute thing. Yeah. And they were all like much slower now and trying to refine and stuff and it's like, oh that's really good. And yeah. We we can put, we should probably do this more often, like a few quick ones before yeah. long pose or something. But I guess that's a different method. Yeah, I, I don't typically do a lot of short stuff. I did teach a gesture drawing class at BYU once, and it was really fun. But um, yeah, I, for the way I think and the way we do it here, the the short poses are pretty useless for me. I'm not saying they're useless for everybody. I'm just saying I haven't found much value in it. Uh, technical stuff, distance to the model, or ideal distance. Da Vinci said, in order to take in a subject at once, so at a glance, or to, in order to take in the whole of the subject at a glance, you should be three times the height of the subject away from the subject. So, if the subject's five feet tall, fifteen feet. Fifteen feet away. Yeah, and I, and I'm not saying that you have to draw it from fifteen feet away, but in order to assess it all at once, you have to back up. 
Um, so getting that physical distance can really be helpful if you're, especially if you're drawing relative size. You know, if you're not doing side size, but you're you're doing something where the model's this big and you're drawing this big or something. Um, in order to to assess the entirety of the proportion, you, you have to get back and so that as you glance at it, it, it all fits into that singular field of vision. You know, you can take in the whole at once. Um, so I think that's a, a pretty good rule, whether or not you're going to draw from that standpoint, assessing it from that standpoint can be really helpful. But if you're drawing, let's say, from the long drawing parts instead of... Yeah, I, I think it's just good you know, during the breaks to stand up and step back uh, and just look at it, uh, look at the drawing uh, from there. Uh, it's just useful. Uh, height for the model stand. Like how tall, like how tall do I build a model stand? Yes. Because there's this uh, classroom in Mexico that has like a, the table, the, the model stand is not really a model stand, it's just built on tables and I feel it's way too high. Yeah. It's like well, it depends. Thing. If you're going to do, like, you're pretty tall, I'm pretty tall. So if I was going to do a, a portrait where they were seated um, and I wanted to look more directly at them, of course I have to have a, a taller model stand. Um, but if it's a standing pose, um, then typically I, th I would say, you know, maybe 14 inches high, maybe between 12 and I'd say 18 is probably a little bit too high, but maybe 12 and 16 inches at the tallest. Uh, for, for a typical model stand is probably what I would, I've built three of them now and that's typically where I'm at, is between 12 and 16 inches line. But then we have boxes on top of that, you know, so, so you can raise it if you need to. Lounge, lounge, lounge. Yeah, you have things you can kind of stack uh, on it if you need to, so. Yeah, for well, if I wanted like a reclining pose, like a full reclining pose, yeah, I suppose yeah, you'd like to have a little higher yeah. level, almost. Mm -hmm. And we're close to the end here. Okay, how do you choose the models? But we already talked a little about that. Like, which models are would be good for like certain poses or portraits? Like, like the guy from the pizza parlor. I didn't think much about him. No. But you thought he would be interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, of the of the of every ten people I ask, only maybe like one or two will actually get back to me anyway. So, I ask people that you know might be interesting, um, but I I don't assume that they're gonna necessarily call me. You know, so I mean we're in a we're in a little bit of a. A smaller town it's not Mexico City where there's millions of people uh, and there's hundreds to, to choose from one thing to pose for. yeah um, so a, a lot of times it's availability <laughs> who who is willing to sit for us uh, ideally ideally it's I I ask people that who I can see a, a, a painting of when I look at them do you know what I'm saying? If I, if I see something that I think that could be interesting on paper, could look um, nice on the drawing. Yeah, like you're the um, like the guy at the pizza parlor had the really scruffy, and <laughs> I thought I thought he had um, a very strong brow ridge and deep set eyes, which would look great under the light. You know, that may, would make for really great shape making in terms of really isolating those features and making a strong portrait. Um, I didn't necessarily, you know, I'm look, not looking for like George Clooney or Pierce Brosnan. I'm, I'm just yeah, looking no. for um, what I things. think will look good on paper. And then I'll, I'll ask, and it, it, it doesn't always work out like that. Like I've, I've had some people in that I thought for sure this is going to be amazing. And then they, um, they look completely different work. on the model stand than I had expected. Um, that doesn't happen often, but sometimes, you know. Uh, so, so I've done enough portraits and enough figures 
to be able to kind of conceptualize that as I'm walking around in public and looking at people. And I can't separate, I can't separate that part of my brain mm -hmm. from, from, yeah, like shopping for, for, you know, black beans or <laughs> you know, buying a steak at the grocery store. Like, oh, I, I don't, I, yeah, I'm not looking at people. I, I'm still constantly assessing in, in a, artistic way which is weird but um it's probably very unsafe especially driving on the freeway because i i'm you know i'm looking at the clouds and the colors on the mountains and whatever and i'm really shocked i'm still alive not dead on the freeway somewhere uh, and there's this model i ha i have never made not even a single drawing or a quick one or a long one or whatever that remotely looks like her. There's just these people that are really hard to draw and there's this other that you can put three lines on the paper and it already looks like her. But yeah. Like the this one and the last one we had. Like Brian was saying like I have like a ton of portraits but none of them look like her. Yeah just this one just started to look Yeah. I guess that's like what you were saying, you know, never know. Yeah, some models have been proven to be extremely elusive to me. You feel like, like they have really strong portraits and you feel like you should be able to nail down their, that character so quickly and somehow mm -hmm. there's this elusive quality. Uh, Jess has been that for me too. Uh, I've had a few models like that and then others it's just like, like immediately there they are you know um yeah i don't know what that phenomenon is yeah so the last one is drawing as finished works like for example i'm not all that interested in making change to painter i think i would like to remain as a good draftsman and just that yeah. Is that are you saying that because you've done a lot of painting and and uh, you prefer the medium? Of, I have of drawing? done a lot, but I do prefer like anything dry. Yeah. Over paint. Because you hate washing brushes so much that you just never want to ever have to do that. No. I, uh, <laughs> there's those little things that I do enjoy. One of them is washing dishes. And setting, you know, well, having having said that, said that, I do, I do like, for example, I like making uh, the priming for the panels. When we they taught like you have to do it with your hands, yeah, to mix everything, the powders, and then add the water. I like doing that, and I like priming panels, and I like washing brushes. Yeah. Okay, so but I just you don't need to be my studio to... assistant. You like all the stuff that I hate. <laughs> this would be amazing. We're, we're going to make a good team. Yeah. Uh, no, the reason I ask is because um, but it's I, not those little things that stop me. Yeah, it's yeah. The painting part that I just don't enjoy as much. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, that's why I ask because I I think some people get I feel like they you know, do one thing and they get really comfortable with that and the confidence that they gain here and the fear of something that may be a little bit less known, something that they haven't done as much, um, may say, well, I'll just stay here because that's comfortable versus going here. Uh, but, but if, you know, if you're doing, if you've done a lot of both and you're saying, you know, I really love this, I love the effects of it, I love um, um, the, the process of it, then, then that's something um, different, but uh, um, I, I, I don't see any argument again that, that's valid to me against drawings as as uh, finished, finished works. Work. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I do. There's too know. many artists doing amazing drawings to, to make that argument. I know that, for example, that paint sell at a higher price. Yeah, that's true. I, I think the I think there's a permanence to painting. Uh, there's a feeling of, of uh, 
there's a quality to it. Uh, there's a, I think, a, a proven longevity and, and uh, archival quality. You know that it's going to definitely be around for a long time. I think there's a delicate nature to drawings that make them seem less permanent, maybe. Um, a little bit more fragile and suspect uh, in terms of the medium. But, um, uh, and I know like for me in the past, framing drawings has been such a nightmare uh, um, because they are so fragile. But I've, I've started to mount all my paper and now I frame a drawing like I do a painting and it's, it's much, much easier. And I feel like um, by preparing the paper the way I'm preparing it now, they become as permanent as, uh, mm -hmm. as a new painting. So, um, yeah, I mean, I love drawing too. Uh, and and I, uh, yeah, I, I think that you don't have to just, you shouldn't have to justify that this is a finished work. You know, finished work in any medium, if it's good, is a finished work. Uh, but but it is true, and I don't know why, but it is true that that they don't sell for as much. No, not that I would. Yeah. Uh, but they but, but maybe they could. Do you know what I'm saying? Like Michael Grimaldi does some no, phenomenal drawings, and no. and uh, I can't imagine that that you know he's not they pulling mean, decent prices for them. I mean I don't know, but uh, but I would imagine. When you hang your hat on that, and and that becomes your body of work, I think, you know, people have to respect that. And if it's if it's great, like Michael Grimaldi's drawings are great, there's value to that, you know. So beyond the medium. Last one. Why? Uh, how long would it take to become a master professional learner, craftsman? Those are all wise. three different questions. Master, I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot that goes into that. Um, but I, but I think you can have mastery of certain elements of, of the process, right? You can, you can always have good proportion. You can get to a point where proportion is is just an yeah, absolute. Right. Yeah. You can have a great line quality always. You can have a, a really great understanding of value control, harmony. Uh, you can develop a, a, a great sense of color, color balance and harmony. Um, but I think, I think the foundations, um, in order to really build a strong foundation where you are self-sufficient in that foundational knowledge, I would say to be fair to most people, they should give themselves four to five years uh, to really develop into your own person, your own voice, and your own touch beyond that foundation, I would say another four to five years to, to be really fair. Um, and uh, like a doctor's specialty? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you, yeah, I, I would like, it, it would be far more beneficial in our artistic culture if that was the expectation from the beginning, you know? If, if, I, if I'm a, geez, a freshman in high school and I go to my guidance counselor and I say, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I say, a doctor. Even at that age, I know basically how much schooling I'm in for. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I already... I already know what, what the expectation is, but an artist has, doesn't have that expectation. You go to, you, you get a, you're in, in high school, you, all your friends look at you and say, oh, he's the artist, he's the artist. You're already an artist. Can you imagine yeah, if, if all it took in high school is you said, I want to be a doctor, and then everybody was like, oh yeah, he's the doctor, he's, doctor. he's the doctor. And then you go to college and they're like, all right, let's start, mm -hmm. let's start, cutting people open. It's just not how it works. But in art, it is. You go to college and they start giving you these assignments. Okay, let's make a bunch of stuff. And, and uh, that's ridiculous. There's, so, there's some oils and you have some, some brushes now. Yeah, right? mimic this artist and go try something like this and make all these, make, 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 make. And 
yeah, I think it's really detrimental to the psyche of the development of an artist. I think if we could change the expectation to where they knew it was a, a, a progressional skill development thing and that uh, it was going to take time, people would people would have a different outlook on it. And, and, and it's really a, an respect. element of being fair to yourself. I mean, it's really unfair to think I can just jump into this and, and do whatever I want. Um, or, or I'll just, I'll, maybe I'll take a workshop here and, and yeah, then, uh, yeah, uh, I'll give my, I'm gonna give myself like uh, five days with this artist and then learn as much as I can. It's, that's really, really unfair to yourself. Uh, but if you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn this stuff and it, I'm gonna take as long as it takes. And it takes different for every individual. Some people move through that process really quickly. There's things that make sense to them that they uh, um, understand and can develop that knowledge uh, a little bit faster than others. And some take a little bit longer than others. It doesn't, it's not something that you can just say, okay, we have 30 days of class. And once that's over, it's over. It's, it's so unique and personal to the individual. So. I would say the average would be four to five years, but it could be a little bit faster and maybe could be a little bit slower. But I, I think indiv each individual student has to ultimately say, this is what I want to achieve. And, uh, and, and if your priority is to be on the road to mastery, then settle in and allow yourself to come to that knowledge. You can't force it. You can't make it happen any faster than it's going to happen. You can just put your head down work like crazy, get great guidance along the way, and, and oh, it'll yeah. come when it comes, you know? Don't, don't cut that short. There's or a, drawing. what's that? Or drawing, just drawing. I think drawing is, I mean, a foundational, foundational drawing. I would say on average two years. Um, you know, mastery drawing that, you know, obviously it's a lifetime. You're constantly developing and refining, um, but there's there's a good book that I think would be good for everybody to read. It's called uh, Peak, P E A K, Secrets to the New Science of Expertise, and ev everyone, most everyone's heard of the the ten thousand hour rule. Um, these are the guys that did the research that they based that on. Did I ever tell you this? Mm. I'm going to say it again because you're recording it. But um, uh, the idea is, um, or they're they're expounding on that. They're saying it's not just ten thousand hours. It's there's three pillars on which this concept rests. Uh, one is yes, time spent, um, and and ten thousand hours is a is a basic average to get to mastery of of any um, discipline. But the other pillars, the second pillar is that that time is spent on deliberate practice, mm -hmm. meaning that the practice is organized and it is, is a, it's, a, it's based on a regulated progression. You start with simple things and you get more and more complex. And every time you go to practice, you're practicing really specific things that are, are at your place in that progression and that will allow you to get to the next step in you your progression. You wouldn't be just like scribbling over and over and over 10,000 hours. Yeah, 10,000 hours, if you're just doing the same thing over and over, you get really efficient at doing something poorly. Um, but the regulated practice makes sure that you're doing it in a, in a system that is increasingly more difficult. As you build this skill, you build another skill on top of it and another skill on top of it. The third pillar that is imperative is that that practice is watched over by somebody who's already mastered the skills. So they can make corrections in your practice so that you don't continue to make the same mistakes over and over and carry those mistakes into these later uh, uh, assignments. So without those three things, the 10,000 hour rule is, is almost void. Do you know what I'm saying? So. So if, if everyone understood that those three principles are true across the board scientifically, this is human development, this is the way we 
would develop skill or mastery in any discipline, whether that's music, dance, sports, whatever, um, then, I, then I think uh, approaching art de or development as an art student with that mindset um, would help them get past some of the absurdity that exists in art, a lot of art schools today, where it is just uh, um, random experimentation and, and mm -hmm. you know, critiques based on taste and opinion and ridiculous nonsense instead of how do I, what are the steps? What are the steps I need to take to progress towards this ultimate goal of becoming a great draftsman and a, uh, um, and a great painter. Um, yeah, people understood that. I think I think their educational choices, the way they spend their time, would uh, be easier to determine uh, how they just spent their time and who they spent their time with, under what educational system they spent their time. Well, that's one or well, it's a, probably a double question in one. But there's your year of drawing. Subject year of drawing, I think UBC has something like that, like one year of drawing, and yeah. that's it. With what you've seen of my work and what you saw that I did during this month, how far or how fast or how much could I learn in that year, and how far would I be able to teach that? In a year's worth of study? Yes, school I, time. I think, um, uh, I think when you started, there was a lot of, um, there was probably what I saw in some of the drawings that you submitted for your, your scholarship entry. There was definitely, um, a sensitivity for for certain elements of observation like you were it, it seemed to me that you had uh, an sort of natural intuition for observing life in front of you but there was some clumsiness in execution uh, in terms of value control or what information to put in what information to, to pull out um, and so when you started your drawing here at the beginning of the month, there was that clumsiness that was evident. Uh, and through the course of, say, the four-week drawing, um, it, when you got a critique, you immediately were able to digest that information and apply it. And that's not always the case. Sometimes, you know, people have to hear something four, five, six times before they're able to, you know, before it clicks and they can then apply it. So I, I feel like your natural intuition for observation um, definitely shortens the amount of time that it would take you to understand these things because there's already an, an inclination towards that knowledge. Uh, and then your ability to um, process the information and apply it is also uh, something that uh, seems to to come very intuitively for you. So in that sense, I think you probably would make more rapid progress than the average student. Um, it's hard to gauge completely because you never know if there's little things that uh, an individual is gonna get hung up on. Do you know what I'm saying? It sometimes happens, sometimes it's just incredibly fluid and people fly through. I've, I've experienced both with, with students. Um, but I, I would say if you were able to give, uh, you know, the, this education a solid year of study, I, I, I would say you definitely not just make it through the program, but you'd be, you'd be at working at a really high conscious level awareness of, of those skills. I mean, you, I think you would really solidify those skills uh, to the point where um, you'd be, well, I was, I was going to say you'd be able to teach them very well, yeah. but teaching is a whole other thing, you yeah. know, uh, uh, communicating that. But that's one of the parts of our program as well that I, I really want to help people with is learning how to communicate that. So I think if you were doing that for a full year and as part of that, you know, there was 
we were also having a new student teach or something, I try to help critique student teachers' critiques so that they can uh, refine their ability to communicate as well. Uh, I think I think you could be a huge asset to um, you know people at home with the knowledge that you would develop here. Uh, I, I would say, from what I saw in a month, a year would would change your whole life. All right. Yes. That's pretty much it. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you some questions. Sure. So, so, um, what's your favorite color? Black. <laughs> wait, wait, no, blue. Can you do some monkey fighting? <laughs> yeah. So, so how was it here? Do you feel like you, um, you know, because you're coming from a different education, you know, I don't know what your education, but obviously it's, it's different than here. Um, but in terms of uh, how the information was presented, um, your experience, the things that you've seen, because you, you, you're aware of Grand Central Academy, Barnes Academy, you're, you're kind of, Follow I'm that just, world. Just um, um, is it is the education what you expected? Is it is it uh, how would you gauge the effectiveness of how the information was presented in terms of your own development? There's this thing that I there's there's this article I read about the GTA and uh, the part that Tom Kurinak said yeah. the part that. So with that, that stuck with me was the regulated part, like start simple and then go start little by little. And the first year in the faculty we had this teacher, Jaime Levy, he started teaching us or we started drawing cans and he was, he would just set up like two soda cans and you had to draw that and then spade them a little bit more and I want to see that space in your drawing and it has to be and I, we didn't see like where that was going to because we had also the model like readily available so you didn't have to go through these steps you didn't have to start with a bar with a simple bar and then start adding stuff yeah. and I, right now when I set up that cast again I instantly realized like yeah there's got to be like two or three steps in between these yeah before you can like jump on and start doing stuff I like that it is like I you, that you can see clearly like how the steps should be done and why yeah why you cannot just let people like do whatever you want however you want and it's gonna be fine no it doesn't work like that uh, I'm thinking of, I mean I, I've already I'm already thinking like how I want to do things and I definitely like like having your art drawing working working on it at the same time as you're working on the long post trying to apply what you just learned yeah like try to see things here and then try to apply it on the other side I like that. I do feel that uh, there's there's the GCA guys that do the figure long figure long post figure drawings with pencils. Yeah. And just probably add a little charcoal in the end to yeah. get to widen that fringe. Maybe that one, but that would take a like longer time then to make the switch from the one to the other. That, I guess that's the thing that you that you said that you, we we have to adjust on the on the go. Yeah. Everybody learns a different way. Yes, there's people that get things like really fast and all. But in general, I think it's very different, very 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 different. Uh, the problem I'm having in Mexico is that you can there's no goals. There's no long-term goals. There's exercises, but you never see where you're going. Yeah. There's never okay. This is gonna help you to do this. Right. There's never that thing. There's no references to future or past or. It's just like doing exercises. 
Yeah. Just discreetly the same thing. Now draw with your left hand. Yeah. Now let's do like a five minute uh, contour. And it's just that like there's yeah. no no regulation. Right. No goals. No advancement. Yeah. Just a ton of a ton. It's like it's like a melting pot of ideas and and experimentation. Yeah. They just sort of randomly pick out. And everything Let's try this. If you yeah. if you're better at drawing than somebody else, it doesn't matter because that guy probably is gonna go like abstract or contemporary. Yeah. And he's more gestural. Right. Right. He's got. He's more sensitive. It's some. It's funny because sometimes they're more sensitive than you are. Yeah. Because of the way they do things. Right. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with it. Yeah. I don't know if that answers of any of this. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's it's interesting, you know, coming from such a different background. I think everybody, uh, the, the consensus is, uh, you know, when you experience an education like this, it's just. It changes so much your understanding of um, how much easier it could be and how much clearer it could be and, and that this information is accessible that uh, you know whatever your goals are are, are achievable and uh, you know this is a really effective way of, of getting it so um, it, it, it's you know it's nice to hear that you know it's, it's a similar it's a similar um, experience for you as most people uh, getting into that education is just there's a clarity to it that um, that exists but um, well, well I was when I got back to drawing after my 10 year talk of doing all this stuff I started going on my own again like just practice every day go to every drawing session I could find and just draw and there was almost anyone that would tell you what to do. It's just sure. like on your own, discover things on your own. And I advanced to a certain point in four years. From that point, and then I went to study with Remy a few times. I took his course like three times or four times. And I felt like I went a little bit further. Yeah. But there was this, still this bridge, like having a finished drawing. I mean, I've gotten close. I probably have a small little bit here and there that I can say it's finished, but I don't have a finished drawing. Yeah. And I wanted to go then, like that little step more. Yeah. There's this. Uh, I think it's from Barcelona Academy. It's a drawing that is like a that is like nine phases of work. I was usually saying like I feel like I get to the sixth or the seventh, but. Yeah. I don't know what they're, how to get Yeah, there. what's next, yeah. And for that, I need somebody that knows how to get right. there, so how he can explain that. how to get there, right. to reveal the secrets and the, yeah. the way well, to I get there. I think you did it here. I think that that figure you, you did, your four-week figure, turned out beautifully. I feel like, mm -hmm. like that, that's the one where you just like nudged over the edge, really wrapped that up, finished it. Yeah. Yeah. Now I should. Well, now I need to like reinforce that knowledge. Yeah. Make like you say, like make it mine. Right. Right. Know what I'm doing, so I can do it like on your own. Yeah. Cool. We'll come back. I'll try. For sure. Good. And it's my time. All right. Thank you very much. Very good having you this month. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to. I know it wasn't easy, but thank your girlfriend for giving for giving us your time. Yes, yes. Very nice of her. Yeah, thank you for having me over, even though you were you were even gonna be in a tough spot after he left and all that. Yeah. But I thought it was like really I really needed to get in touch with you because you have the experience, you have uh, what is it? all the difficulties I wanted to know how to sort, yeah. drawing being one of them. Good.